This reminds me of uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, how joyous he was to be, you know, on his way to martyrdom. It makes you think, like, how radical is this, is this faith for somebody to invite martyrdom into their lives, knowing that he could have, he could have you know, recanted his views and sa spared his life, but he, he went into the martyrdom willingly. And, you know, I, I look at the monks as well. The monks really fascinate me because it's like a breakdown of our personal will. You know, to be a monk, you know, you pretty much have to, um, <clears throat> you pretty much have to overcome your personal desires because to be a monk, I mean, <clears throat> that's pretty intense, right? I mean, like, what can you tell us about people that decide to go live in the monasteries and dedicate their lives fully, like they're dying in this life completely to the passions? Well, I think that the monastic life is, I mean, there's one kingdom of heaven that we're all going to, married and monastic. People can kind of confuse that, I think, sometimes. Or I think there's like a monastic spirituality or there's a married spirituality. Certainly the way in which you live it out is different, but it's the same. You know, I'm not a monk. Um, I spent lots of time in monasteries, and you know, I've been to Monathos and Georgia and Greece and Bulgaria and Serbia and, and the monasteries in America, and I'm really thankful for that experience. I think it's important. One of the things our eminence metropolitan Saba, who is totally dedicated to the spiritual life, I might add, and why I love him and we love him is that the number one thing to him is the kingdom of heaven and this, this seeking. Um, and he lives as a true monk and the one thing needful, right? Like you were saying, it's the same kingdom we're after. That said, it's always been the understanding, there's a great phrase that, that angels are the light of monastics and monastics are the light of men. There's even an iconographic portrayal of this. And I think that our modern society, American society, it has no idea about monasticism at all. It's like a, and even many Orthodox in America, before um, Elder Ephraim established the monasteries and some of the Russian monasteries, there was no understanding what monasticism was. There was, and even there was somewhat of a Protestantization of some of the Orthodox churches in America. You know, people are surprised sometimes you come in and there's an organ and there's pews and there's different things. And they go to the old country, it's not there. That's because they came here and they try to assimilate. And of course, the church is the church is the church. It doesn't matter if there's pews or not. That's not, it doesn't matter. Not what I'm, I'm just simply saying to know our ethos, to know that monasteries and parishes should have a symbiotic relationship. That's really important, and that we often don't know that. We have to go far. You know, old country, you can, well, the monasteries everywhere. So in, in a sense, there's an, that's an, an ideal that's always around. I've never been a monk, but um, you know, having 10 children, my two oldest daughters, when they finished school, both went to the monastery, and they're both novices. And, and my own spiritual father is a monastic, and many of my best friends are monastics. And I'm convinced that we all have to live the same life. Really, it's not just for them. You know, when someone's made a catechumen, you do the catechumen prayers and you bless them before they're baptized, you say, the, I don't know what the translation is now, but the newly enlisted warrior of Christ. We're all called to be warriors for Christ. Yeah, the monastics are like the special forces, that's true. And we say, but even a grandma in a wheelchair, even a baby, like we're all called you know, to be a Navy SEAL, you got to be in great shape and you got to be one percenter, you know, but everybody can be a warrior for Christ, which implies there's a battle and the world doesn't want to hear that. And we go to church to be everything to be great, and nice and comfy, you know, as comfortable Christianity, which Father Seraphim Rose said, there's no such thing, only suffering orthodoxy. So I think that monastics always uphold that ideal for us. Um, and it is a life of complete renunciation, right? But I think it's I would say two things. One, I think it's radically amazing and um, transformative. And two, I think that we have to approximate it in our own life in a different way, let me say this. So why is it amazing? I always say, like, I know my kids, you know, they're rascals and fun. And I remember my daughter when she was this big, and now I see her at the monastery working hard. And, and I said, you know, do you think monastics are sadists? <laughs> do you think they're just like, you know what, I have an idea. We're going to go somewhere. You're going to sleep very little. Um, you're going to eat very little and not what you want. Um, you're going to work for hours and hours. You're going to be sweating your brains out, do thousands of prostrations. You're, not going to, you're going to ask to get a blessing to get a glass of water. You're going to be humiliated. You're going to be, you know, putting your, your pride will be checked at every moment. You're going to wear long garb and your head covered. And you're like, does someone just go like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. 
Like no, no person could endure that for very long. Like, thank you, sir, may I have another, this kind of self-flagellate, like I'm, I'm gonna suffer for Jesus. This is not the orthodox way. And so a person that's not called would leave pretty quick because they would only see the bad sides of that. The things I just said, like, well, that stinks. I don't want to do any of those things. And so why would they do it, is the question. They just, like, say this and just going to tough it out. I've learned that no one really can do that. What they learn is that there's a pleasure greater than sexual pleasure. There's a pleasure greater than the pleasure of food, the pleasure of drinking, the pleasure of drugs, the pleasure of a bed, the pleasure of you know, all the things that get in the world. And it's hard to believe that exists. And that's what Christ promises, is that there's spiritual pleasure. Father Joseph Copeland, you should talk to him someday, a fantastic priest, Yakima, Washington, inspired me years ago about this, from the fathers saying that they, they're spirit, after spiritual pleasure. So they're not sadists, and maybe in some ways they're even more selfish, in the sense of they want pleasure, but they want an eternal pleasure. They want something that can't be taken from them. They learn that, that to die is, is for Christ is gain. In other words, that we say, like, I'm hungry, uh, unhappy. Feed the belly, happy. For a minute until you're sick and there's a hangover. Like, oh, I'm anxious. Come on, have a couple drinks. Oh, I'm happy until you're sick. Right? You don't eat so much ice cream and sleep so much and have sexual temptation. And, you know, there's always a hangover. And it's limited but the spiritual life is not limited. So when monastics said, it's the only place in the world where you're, and this is not just for monastics, but in this ascetical spiritual life is where you're constantly hungry and you're constantly being filled. As they understand the secret of the spiritual life, we're not Gnostics, but the, the, the center of it is deny yourself. It's not secret at all. The Lord says it, carry your cross and follow me. If you love your life in this world, you'll lose it. You know, dive, it's radical, like you were saying. I always say it's radical, radically beautiful, radically transformative, radically painful if we try to live a worldly Christianity. I always tell people, try to be really worldly and successful and good looking and cool and rich, and then try to be really spiritual. You just stink it up at both. And the Lord says, give me all your heart. The Psalms say, give me thine heart. You know, if you're lukewarm, they'll spit you out, right? The, 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 the scriptures say that sense of whenever we sacrifice for God with a good soul, with cheerfulness, with love for God, not with like a kind of like a weird, less like self-hatred or something, that's weird, but just really love for God, self-denial. Okay, I'm going to carry my cross, Lord. I'm going to love fasting more than eating food. You can. You know, I'm going to love praying more than sleeping. Most of us just don't believe it's possible. And a lot of people take all their passions and they bring them into their religious experience. Or God forbid they want them to be baptized, Right? So for an Orthodox Christian to take all those things into the faith and not uproot those things would be hell. It happens. People often say, oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> yes, yeah, Jesus' fault. No, you have to engage in the ascetical life. And the beautiful thing is, you can see why so many of the saints were monastic. Because the, it's a whole place tailor-fit to uproot these passions of this life, replace it with virtue and holiness and meeting God and creating a faith that if you can stay up all night for 12 hours in a vigil, if you can take being humble than your own, you can be crucified. And actually Christ is alive in you. Whew. Most of the world doesn't, it's not like a, we're never going to be a Joel Olstein situation in orthodoxy because it's like, hey, I got, have I got a deal for you? You're not going to eat much. You're going to give everything you own. You're going to, there's no kingdom in this world. But if they only tasted the pleasure, you know, one of the saints says, if people knew how hard it was in a monastery, you could apply this to the Orthodox Church. They knew ahead of time how hard it was going to be. You couldn't tie them down. They'd run away and pull the whole tree up and run away. But if they knew the joy of the monastic spiritual life, they would drop everything and run to monasteries. I think it's the same thing with the church. They'd drop everything and run to become Orthodox Christians. So all that is to say is what looks like doom and gloom and hardship and everything, it's not done for itself. It's done for, out of love for Christ. And it's done above all those things are done for prayer. Because, you know, the, the saints and the elders tell us that, you know, the kingdom of heaven is within us, like I mentioned. And we have to go there. And if you ask the average Christian, like, what do you mean? I think they'd be a good person. They'd believe in Jesus. All true. But you have to go, the kingdom of heaven's within there. You better spend time in there. 
If it's within you, if you don't ever go within yourself or know yourself, I mean, St. Isaac says to know yourself is greater than to raise the dead. So to go in there, and I met Paul Narothios Vlakos, who's a well-known bishop and elder in Greece, came and spoke to us years ago, and he said, we have to go in there. And he said a beautiful thing. He said, after baptism and chrismation and receiving the Holy Spirit, there's a temple in our hearts, and it's waiting for the liturgy to take place. And it's waiting for the priest to come serve liturgy there. And he said, who's the priest? I said, the priest is the Holy Spirit. And he wants to get there. But how does the priest get to the heart? There's obstacles. And our fallen man, what are they? There's boulders along the path. Lust, pride, anger, laziness. And we through the ascetical life. And he said, I said, how do we get through that? He said, drill, drill and drill with the prayer of Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. The prayers, the repentance, the life of the church, the mysteries, this drills. And we have to remove those boulders of lust and pride and anger and lack of forgiveness. Just the life of the church. Not just the externals of showing up, you know, but going deeper. And what this does is that through, the, through our, our will, Protestants say, you're saving yourself? No. Right? There's an ocean of God's grace and our, all this effort we do is one, you know, doink, one drop but it's an actualizing drop for the whole ocean. We have to, it's our amen to God. His grace is not irresistible. We can resist it. But now we invite it in the ascetical life. And he says, eventually, the saints are those, and it can be for us, where the Holy Spirit, not hindered by our passions, can enter the church. And now the Holy Spirit is serving liturgy in your heart. I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the room among priests. And he said, imagine if you have liturgy in your heart, and then you're a priest and you have liturgy in your hands. I mean, it's just, this, is, this is the essence of orthodoxy, is that we're called to know God and be united with Him. And it's not just big words, or it's not automatic when you get baptized. It's, it's the purpose for whole life. And all the things we do in church, from baptism, chrismation, you know, confession, all these things. Confession isn't like, don't feel guilty anymore. <laughs> it's to be, see ourselves and be forgiven by God with the help of our spiritual Father to clear this, these boulders and to cleanse this path so that we don't inhibit it so the Holy Spirit, we can find the kingdom of heaven within us. And I'm convinced to my own paltry experience in the life of the saints and being at monasteries that that's the ticket for everyone, for priests in the world like me, who are very sinful, and for my wife, a mother of 10 children running around, and a mama with 10 children, or a mama with two children, whatever it is, or a guy going to work, he can say the Jesus prayer in the car. He can make some prostrations in the morning, right? He can fast, okay. We can often look at the monastics and go, wow, it's so amazing. The kingdom, I'm just a married guy. Just, that is a lie. And don't ever believe that somehow they're overly superior. Like, no doubt they're the Navy SEALs, but like, married life is beautiful. But not because it's the opposite of that. You see, that's too often thought like, I'd like to be a monk, but uh, you know, that sounds, I just want to be worldly and carnal. Sorry, you can't do that and be orthodox. People do. But the idea is, yes, the marriage of relations is not sinful, but is it loving or is it just lust? Are you just sanctifying lust, or have you, do two really become one, like St. John Chrysostom says? Do couples cultivate this in their... Monks don't cultivate that because they're monastics. But a husband and wife have to cultivate that. And when they cultivate fighting their lust and becoming out love and union, that's another boulder moved. So their sexual life, forgive me, doesn't inhibit their path in the journey. It actually is a purification. That doesn't happen a lot. People don't talk about that as much as they should. That's our ascetical life as married people. No, you deny yourself. A mama walking, you have kids, walking, you know, a crying baby at night. The Nazis don't do that. They get up and they do their prayer rope. Why can't a mama who's walking kids have her prayer rope too? Why can't she be saying the Jesus prayer? And do you think that that's any less acceptable to God? No way. It's just as beautiful. We're seeking the same kingdom in that moment. It's like in a monastery, you have there's an abbot or an abbess, and there's monks or nuns, and they all have their jobs. It's the same in an Orthodox family, right? I'm the abbot of my house. Right? And my wife is the abbess too. <laughs> but, but everyone has their jobs. Everyone has their obediences. That is their job. They'll have their rooms, their cells. There's, and there's, there's kerfuffles and there's conflict, but you work it out. But we're doing the same thing, doing our prayer rules, going to church, asking forgiveness, loving each other. It's the same life. I just wish, I, I, I hope that Orthodox Christians see that the married life is just as sanctifying. We have to maybe work harder at it, but it's just as sanctifying. Not by nature, not automatically, 
But if we engage, just like a monastery that does, the external things doesn't go deep, that wouldn't be helpful either. But we have to look to them, the ascetical life, but not that life in parishes should be just as dynamic in terms of this process I'm talking about as it is in the monastery. They're just doing kind of par excellence. We can go visit, get some strength, and bring it back. I love going to monasteries, but I love leaving. You know why? Not because I want to leave, but because I can't wait to bring back my new zeal to really love my people and to bring LDS people. If they could just know that they can know Christ so deeply, that they can be forgiven of all that guilt, that they can not be afraid of death, that they can really meet Christ and not be plagued. This is what orthodoxy is. It's healing. It's a hospital, right? We take, speak of the church as a spiritual hospital, and all the medicine is there. But as one priest said, what good is it if we have all the hospital? We're just sitting in the waiting room reading magazines because we're afraid. So God inspire us, priests. Again, I, I don't know much Paul Tensaba very well, but in my few times with him in conversations, he always has his prayer rope moving. And he's clearly praying and telling the seminarians and the priests, spiritual life is number one. Priests aren't going to be businessmen or any of these things, all secondary. If we're not living it, we're hypocrites as priests. And the beautiful thing about all the men that you've interviewed so far, some of my mentors, some of them were my assistant priests, some of them are my best friends, they all inspire me in the same way. Because this is, this is life, and life abundantly. Like To know Christ in this life is it's worth everything. That's why everyone should be orthodox. Forgive my boldness, because it can heal everything. 